thank you so much for being on the show, Adil. It's a pleasure to have you. Yeah, thanks for having me, Minaj. Um, one of the things about uh, those prosthetic arms um, is that they're so fascinating. They're bringing so many people out of um, their disability. And um, that is probably why there are so many companies out there and uh, doing that. And I was just wondering, what makes psionic hands better than every um, other hand? You have just had a CES demonstration of your hand, and I find it very interesting. Uh, tell me a little bit about more about that. Yeah, so there's several things uh, in particular, and uh, the way we designed this bionic hand. Um, and number one, it's the fastest bionic hand in the world, so it moves two and a half times faster than, than any other hand um, that's available. It's super robust to impact, so I can smash the fingers and they totally survive. We've done push-ups on them. We've broken boards with it, martial arts style. I've even arm wrestled against it and, and lost, so I got to start uh, working out a little bit more. <laughs> um, but it's also the first hand to give users touch feedback, and that's pretty critical when, you know, uh, one of our users is a U.S. Army sergeant lost his hand in Iraq, and he can feel his daughter's hand, and just having that ability is just critical in just your daily lives, right? So um, the best part is, is that we got it covered under Medicare as well. So it's not only advanced in features, but it's more accessible than ever before, too. Uh, we're going to be talking about every um, nit bit of uh, what you just um, told me, but let's talk a little bit about uh, that one feature of multi-articulation where you could actually use different fingers. And I was yeah. just wondering if you had some uh, tests done on just that bank, uh, benchmark, um, if you know the finger was strong enough, you know, it was able to hold the weight um, enough and it's distributed equally. Um, how do you design that? Yeah, so... Um, the fingers themselves, so we, we use like brushless DC motors in here that make the fingers move really fast, right? So they close in about 200 milliseconds. So that's actually faster than we can blink our own eyes, which is a pretty cool um, statistic. Uh, and in terms, of, in terms of strength, like the, the hand itself can hold like a 50 pound kettlebell with no, no issues at all. And we've had our users actually do a lot of exercises with it that they haven't actually been able to do. Uh, before because they the hands just haven't been able to like withstand those kinds of forces uh, put on it so um, yeah we've had like uh, one of our users is the para triathlete national champion from 2018 and 2019 in the U.S. and he was doing like kettlebell swings like 50 pound kettlebell swings and um, and just by putting a velcro strap around the hand he was even able to support his entire body weight and do bench pressing with it which was just awesome. Um, interesting and we're going to actually dissect some of those arguments and you know, have some stats on hand, but let's talk about how did you actually get into all that? Um, you told about your experience um, seeing someone um, who was handicapped um, in, in Pakistan. Just tell me a little bit about that. Yeah, so building bionic hands is something I've wanted to do my whole life ever since I was seven years old. I was born in the Chicago suburbs, but my parents were born in uh, Pakistan. And they, uh, so I was visiting uh, Pakistan when I was like seven years old and that's the first time I met someone with a limb difference and she was my age missing her right leg and using a tree branch as a crutch living in poverty and so that's kind of what inspired me to want to go into this field and develop advanced bionic limbs that were affordable and accessible for everyone. Well talking about um, affordability so here to, here to what we know 80% um, of um, those amputees um, they happen to be in developing work and that's already 10 million people and only 3% of them can afford, you know, if you look at the price mark or benchmark that you have set. And that's already um, around $10,000, uh, if I'm not mistaken. And that still is something um, that won't be helping um, the people that um, you were inspired by, let's uh, put that way. Um, how, why is that, that the cost still remains um, at that level? What can we actually do to bring down the cost for the raw material so that you know, the price can actually go down? It's already uh, quite cheaper than um, the conversion, which is like $77. So I was just wondering, uh, have you had a look in the numbers there? Yeah, and so, you know, uh, one of the things is, is that, um, you know, when you're comparing like the, the scale of the, the hands that, that we need to build, right? Um, it's still not at the level of like something like an iPhone, right? So if we do something like an injection molding run, then it's, it's still cost prohibitive and that makes the, the, the cost go really high. And so one of the initiatives that we're actually starting is to uh, make a, uh, a foundation that can accept donations and subsidize the cost for uh, people in developing nations. And we partner with nonprofit organizations such as the Range of Motion Project that helps provide care to uh, people in developing nations. 
And uh, something that else to be said too, it's not just the device itself that, um, that, that uh, these patients need, right? I mean, we can, we can build like a device and even if it was like $50, we could give it to someone, but then it wouldn't actually be used properly. They have to get therapy, they have to get rehabilitation services as well. And that's why it's so important to be partnering with nonprofit organizations such as the Range of Motion Project so that we can provide not just the devices, but the care that um, users would need going forward. And you also traveled to China with your team uh, to source parts um, for a lot of what goes in the hand, uh, which was a, a fantastic you know, short video about you know, the kind of things that you have uh, done. And a lot of other parts uh, for different electrical electronic components come from China as well, like iPhone itself. And I was just wondering, what was your experience like um, in China? Um, you know, what is technologically um, better um, and faster in China that you know you have to get those parts um, from China? Yeah, and so China was uh, it was quite an experience because um, I, so we went there in the summer of 2017, and it was me, my wife, who was about six months pregnant. Um, and our one and a half year old son and three of our engineers all in a small high rise in, in Shenzhen, which is the electronics capital of the world. And the, uh, what we found there was the, our, our, our motor manufacturers and our gear manufacturers in, in particular. And the thing is, is that um, with the motors that we use specifically, we can't find them anywhere else. Um, they're it's, um, they're uh, basically like drone motors, but they have, um, a gearbox attached to them that are kind of used in like um, things like uh, I like bone saws or like um, a medical device like equipment uh, and like uh, electronic toothbrush type uh, applications as well. And um, we we looked and the the closest or the closest motors we could find were only made in Germany and, and Switzerland, and then they were like five times the price um, as the ones that we had found. Um, in China, and they weren't, they didn't even have the same performance as the ones that we had found um, in, in China as well. And um, the, uh, the company that we were working with was able to customize it specifically to our needs. And that was, that was critical, right? I, I mean, that's why we were able to get the fastest bionic hand in the world is because we went through this customization process and built up all the electronics to support these types of motors um, that no other hand really has. Um, on the market. And the same thing with the gears. I mean, the, our gears are, are pretty small and China has a, a large like history of being able to make uh, these types of gears uh, in particular for like, um, you know, model trains and things like that, like these, these really tiny um, gearing systems. And so uh, by being able to find those manufacturers there, we were able to actually significantly, uh, not only significantly cut our costs, but actually have those items designed into our hand, which we couldn't find anywhere else. And if we split the manufacturing process, you are certainly 3D printing um, the hands with the rubber and silicon component and not normal carbon fiber ones. And I just wondering, do you 3D print at home and then you bring other equipment from China? What's the split? Oh, so the only thing that we get from China is the motors and the gears. Everything else we do basically, it's, it's in-house here in the USA. So it's actually, uh, overall, it's a made in USA product. So all the 3D printing we do in-house, all the silicone molding we do, all the carbon fiber work, all the fabric work, all the assembly um, of the hands and the electronics work we do here in Champaign, Illinois. And does the COVID-19 um, delivery schedules um, affect your uh, manufacturing and the demand process? How, how does that affect you? Yeah, yeah. It, it, uh, I mean, especially as a hardware company, it, it, was, it was hard to go remote um, for a while. <laughs> and you, you can imagine that. Uh, so for a while, you know, we had our 3D printers with our... Um, with our lead mechanical engineer and our silicone molding with like one of our other mechanical engineers and then our electrical engineers had their own setups for doing soldering work at home and I just remember that just to make like the, the power switch that goes on here it took us like one and a half days to do it as opposed to like the three hours that it typically takes when we're in house um, just because you know if they were like someone had the button another person had like the the, um, the enclosure and another person had the circuit board and then each one of those things depended on the other and we had to like just drive them to each other's places and it was just crazy and and so fortunately like after after a month and a half we were able to move back into um, the offices and start uh, like manufacturing it in person again and 
Uh, that just, uh, it, it, having it, doing hardware in person is a lot easier than, uh, than trying to do it remotely. <laughs> Okay. Um, I was just wondering, most of the companies that we work with um, would deal with hardware products. Uh, one of the common problems is that even if you have a hardware product um, and then you ship it out, especially when you're importing the components from China, um, what if something happens to the components? So the repair element of that, that becomes again a cost if you have to send it back or you get a replacement for that, or do you do it in-house? How does that work? Um, uh, so what, what specifically in-house? For example, you get this motor from China, you just have, yep. and if this stopped working, um, and if, or if it needs some kind of repair, or, fail, or it's a piece that's faulty, I mean, what do you do with that? Um, fortunately, we haven't had that issue um, just yet, um, but uh, we we usually get samples uh, ahead of time uh, before we, we get the, like, we make the full large batch order, and um, and because of that, I think um, we, we've done all the testing in house and like we make sure that 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 passes like, you know, all of our criteria and then we haven't had any issues with any like quality or anything like that. Okay, and what if that happens? What if it happens? I mean, regardless of wherever we would get our supply from promoters, I mean, that would be a particular problem, right? So, um, I, I mean, in that case, we would just do like a rerun um, of, of the batch and then, um, yeah. I, I, I mean, I guess we'll cross that bridge when we get there. <laughs> well, lucky you, you haven't had to um, run into that problem because that's uh, pretty often, uh, you know, more often than not, you know, there are companies who don't know uh, what to do. I mean, that generally happened with the Fitbit. Um, they were short of their um, schedule because they couldn't uh, source the right components in the right time. So the customer reviews were really bad. Um, luckily, you know, amputated hands are not in demand that much, uh, but hopefully you're not going to get uh, into that problem. So one of the things that you're doing, uh, which is really interesting, is that um, unlike uh, the other prosthetic arm, which actually does what it's supposed to do, you're putting other features in that also, uh, which is kind of marvelous. So you're putting a USB charging slot uh, in the arm. You also have Bluetooth and God knows what comes next into the arm. I mean, what's next, the Spider-Man web or what? <laughs> Uh, yeah, so you mentioned the USB-C charging, so that's the USB-C uh, port right over there, and then uh, we have an app port on um, iOS and Android, and so one of our newest developments is that we made the fingers conductive so you can use with your cell phone um, as well, and especially for our, our uh, people missing both hands, that's pretty critical because then if they have two ability hands, then they can hold the phone with one hand and then actually use it um, with the other one. Um, but uh, some of the more more crazy stuff that we're we're working on, and uh, we just started partnering with other universities on, is our nerve implants. So instead of just placing muscle sensors on like your the outside of your your arm, um, we're actually um, going to be implanting them on your nerves directly and getting that neural data directly from your body to control the fingers. And so instead, I mean, the way that it's like typically controlled with, um, with these uh, the, with the um, things, these sensors available now is that you're doing like grasps like this, right? So I, I'm just doing like a tripod grasp right there and then I can switch over to like, you know, rock on, right? At, at a rock concert, right? Uh, but you don't, um, like patients typically don't have individual finger control. With the nerve implants, they would actually be able to do individual finger movements and then feel from them too. And so our hand was built for those clinically available systems now where you can do all these like different grasping patterns and then uh, feel with a vibration motor. But then also when these nerve implants come up so that when you, uh, you can do like individual finger movements as well as feel like it's coming from your, your missing hand. Oh, that certainly we're going to be talking about your PhD thesis also, which I find fascinating. And you know, you incorporated that in your product as well about uh, you know these uh, neural implants um, that would give you the tactile feeling. Uh, but let's talk about some other features that you can possibly add, which would one of the things is which is very common, um, and that's now you have to use that you know, if you have your natural arm, which is the biometrics. And the other is the ability to just change the channel, um, you know, work your hand as a remote. And I'm just wondering, what would it take to you know, implant those things, um, you know, those features in the hand? They don't sound terribly complicated, are they? Um, so the interface to the devices isn't, but the method to control that is where it would get, it, it, uh, there still needs to be a lot of work. And that's why I was mentioning things like nerve implants, because if we can directly get those signals from your nerves, then that opens up a much wider uh, array of um, 
basically like human computer interfaces that, that we, can, uh, we can manipulate, right? At, with much higher fidelity than you can with just like, like an open and closed signal with, with two, two muscle sensors, right? Um, and so, yeah, we could easily put like an IR blaster on here and then you could like change channels on your, your remote or like, you know, pay with your, with your hand. Um, and, and like, you know, Google Pay style or like Apple Pay, uh, Apple Wallet style, right? Uh, and I think that's where these things are going to be headed in the future. But the, the interface between the human and the machine needs, uh, needs a lot more improvement. And that's why we're so excited to work on things like nerve implants, where we can improve that interface and then get to those like crazy cool, like superhuman abilities that we all wish we had. <laughs> and uh... I've had the pleasure of um, talking to Greg Gage on his podcast, who's a famous neuroscientist, and you know he has his BCI to control cockroaches, and you know he has some other uh, cool tricks. And then we had Boris Conrad, who's a memory champion in Germany, um, and he's also a neuroscientist at Donner's Institute. And we talked a little bit about um, what can those interfaces do beyond simple prosthetic uh, by using neuromodulation. We could actually you know, do a lot of pain relief um, and things like this. And one of the, those books um, that talk about that um, in animals is Effective Neuroscience, um, you know, which relates to the effective uh, response of animals based on their um, impulses. And I was just wondering, do you have, uh, you, you talked about Android on iOS um, app, and I'm just wondering, what does it actually do? Does it actually, over time, gain um uh, understanding of how you're using your hand and what your impulses are doing and does this have an AI or ML component? I know there's a lot of you know, separated um, threads, but you know what I'm getting at is that what do you use Android and iOS app for? Yeah, so the, the most basic function of the Android and iOS app is to adjust the sensitivity of the muscle sensors and the touch sensors on here. Um, and then to also give um, updates to the hand. So uh, you, the same way that your phone gets over the air updates, you, you can update your hand in the same way, right? Which is just uh, another cool function of it. Uh, but uh, our hand is compatible with uh, machine learning systems that can um, understand your muscle pattern. So instead of just having like two muscle sensors, for example, you can put eight of them going around and then have a machine learning algorithm detect when you're trying to make a pinch or a fist and like um, uh, other grasps as well. Um, and so we are, are currently working with um, other companies and building um, systems in house to leverage that machine learning technology. And so then we can use the app eventually to um, it kind of like aggregate that that information and uh, learn better um, how users can control the hand. Uh, we're gonna get back to your work in Ecuador and Guatemala, where you actually had this um, video shot about um, how did it work with the sensory pressure on different fingers. But uh, let's get to what originated the whole idea, and that was your uh, dissertation. If I don't get it wrong, and that's what you say. Um, the goal of the dissertation is to describe the development and evaluation of various mechanisms that enable simultaneously myometric control of hand prosthesis with um, proprioceptive and touch pressure feedback. Um, and then you have this uh, biomedical uh, engineering uh, paper in Nature um, where you talk about um, that um, implant. And I was just wondering, is that um, the research that you incorporate in your hand as well, uh, where you it could um, measure the pressure and what part of your uh, finger is um, receiving the pressure. Tell us a little bit about, about the, how does it connect. Yeah, yeah. And so um, uh, we actually started the company while I was a, a graduate student um, still. So Psionic was, was born while, uh, after that Ecuador trip that you were mentioning too. And then um, I was doing my PhD at the time and it was on um, uh, some of the aspects that went into the hand too. So um, the fact that this is the first bionic hand available that actually has touch sensing ability um, was a direct consequence of um, us developing a lot of that technology as I was a grad student um, for, uh, for my dissertation, for example. And so um, in the fingers, we've got, um, e e each of the uh, fingers are capable of having six pressure sensors. So one on the fingertip, the finger pad, two on the side uh, and two on the other side of the finger. And we can have 30 sensors total for uh, each of the five digits that are in here. And right now there's a vibration motor that's in here so that when you touch this, it'll, you'll actually feel a vibration when, when you're grabbing an object, when you let go. And, and it's a stronger vibration if you um, uh, press harder, if you like um, hold harder uh, on an object. And we can give that feedback to users 
um, in several ways, right? So one way is through a vibration motor. Another way is through electrical stimulation on your skin. So if we send a little bit of current like across your skin, we can actually make those sensations feel like different things like uh, a light touch, a strong touch, pressure, vibration, even pain, like the entire spectrum of, of mechanical touch. The difficult part is how do you get that to feel consistent over time, like after you take the hand on or off and then put it back on. And so we're actively researching those different methods of how can we give these, um, these uh, uh, people actual touch feedback um, when they're actually using the hand. And that has applications beyond just prosthetics too. I mean, imagine virtual reality or augmented reality, you touch something in virtual reality and you can actually feel like it's a touch on your skin um, as opposed to just a vibration. That's, that's, again, that's kind of the future that we're heading towards. Yeah, and building upon that, would you have um, a controller for uh, the impedance that doesn't shock your patients? Um, and I was just wondering, this is one of the core problems uh, with those BCIs and neurosciences that um, you first have to choose between invasive and non-invasive technology. And then if it's non-invasive technologies, then you have a huge problem um, that you know, the signal, the signal fidelity is the huge problem. How do you actually keep the electrodes on the surface and make sure you know, it's re reliably transmitting all the signals? And um, for that, um, your patients could get a, a, I mean, a huge shock um, if the signals all of a sudden you know, come after a, a, a small lapse. And I'm just wondering, uh, tell us a little bit about more, more about this controller. And you've also had this uh, test um, between uh, different attempts. Um, just tell us a little bit about that. Yeah, yeah. And so one of the um, projects of my dissertation was that if you have like these uh, electrical stimulator electrodes on, right? So you can actually get them at, at like your, your corner drugstore for like 50 bucks. Um, they're called TENS units or electrical muscle stimulators. And um, and the, the purpose of those devices are, are to um, uh, kind of like massage your muscles and block pain. Um, and uh, we kind of repurposed the, that technology essentially um, to stimulate your sensory neurons directly so that you can actually feel different things. And one of the risks there is, is uh, the potential of getting a shock. And it's usually not like, like very strong. It's, it's kind of like a static electricity. It's more surprising than anything else. Uh, but still, you don't want to feel that like, like as you're doing things throughout the day and you're touching objects and, oh man, I feel like a static electricity shock all the time, right? Uh, and part of that reason is, is that um, your skin like has different conditions that it might be in. It might be dry one day, it might be well hydrated, it might be like cracked, it might be like sweaty, it might uh, like all, all these different factors, right? Um, and the, the interface between the electrodes and the skin is, is critical to what that sensation actually feels like. And so what, one of the projects that I had in my uh, PhD dissertation was how can we make that sensation always feel consistently the same, whether you're sweating, whether like the electrodes are starting to peel off so that you never feel like a, a, a shock or you never feel like that, that sensation is going away. And what we did was we actually monitored like the resistance, like the, the resistance of your skin and the, the impedance of it so that, um, so that if that changes, so if you like, if you sweat a lot or if your, your electrodes are peeling off, um, we can adjust the amount of current that we're sending across your skin. So it always feels like a consistent sensation. And that unlocks the potential to be able to wear these devices for a very long time while feeling like a consistent sensation when you, when you do your activities of daily living. I think that solves 50% of the problem, which is not, um, you know, having the impulses where they don't exist and your cords are peeled off, but are you going to get into invasive technologies as well? Yeah, yeah, and so that's uh, the the implanted electrodes is definitely like a a um, avenue that we're heading towards as well, and um, and uh, um, like you had mentioned, right, the signal fidelity is so much better um, when you when you go invasive, and we just started these uh, like these partnerships with uh, like UT Southwestern um, like uh, like a month ago, so this is like brand new stuff that we're super excited to be uh, finally getting to work on and, and actually interfacing, not just with our hand, but like, you know, like with real world, like with objects like computers and video games and things like that. I don't want to feel like I have driven you to that point, but the next problem is electrode scarring. <laughs> uh, so once you have this um, invasive uh, electrode and then you have this electrode scarring problem and as well, how do you have any plans? So actually, have you 
looked into that? How are you going to actually tackle that? Or you know, that comes after you've decided to go um, invasive because a lot of companies are doing that. You know, Elon Musk, uh, uh, Musk's uh, Neuralink has already done that. They have had experiments on uh, um, animals and now they're moving um, to the um, uh, human sector. And I'm just wondering how hard it is to get approval for that uh, from FDA. And if one company has that, why not you? Yeah, and so um, from what I, uh, from after talking with our collaborators at UT Southwesterns, one of, one of the things that they had told us is that they've had um, they've had several patients who have had the electrodes in for at least fifteen months, um, and they haven't had any issues um, with it at all. And they I think they're like um, their study only allows you to have them in for sixteen months, so that's why they had to like uh, explant them um, at that point, and they didn't have any issues with like nerve damage or, or scarring or um uh from from what uh, i i had seen so that's one of the reasons why we think this technology is uh, is definitely promising but again it's it's really new so we don't know yet um and that's what uh that's a lot of the avenues we're trying to explore to see like um is this possible and, and what what can be possible um i recently posted about that um and i believe that's kind of a monumental um improvement in what we know um, so far. There's a company called uh, Synchron, and um, they recently had this uh, BCI um, in someone who is um, handicapped and disabled. And through machine learning, um, this person actually chose letters on the screen, and you know he tweeted um, with that same interface. And I was just wondering if that's something, um, in your opinion, as a neuroscientist and not as only uh, a prosthetic maker. Uh, but do you think that's something that we can lead on to? And Greg Gage has had uh, that experiment also, but kind of an epic failure where um, you could use your neuron activity to predict what you're seeing on the computer. Um, and in, in a futuristic way, that certainly would take the middleman out, um, which is our uh, sensory motor um, system. And we could only control things from our brains. Um, how do you see that? And what are the problems uh, in achieving that dream? Yeah, yeah. And so cortical implants are, are uh, definitely another avenue that I know a lot of companies are looking at. And we, we've been speaking with like um, folks at Neuralink and um, also the University of Chicago and the University of Pittsburgh, where they're doing um, some of that, uh, that cortical implant work uh, in particular as well. And I mean, the thing is with, with the brain, there's still so much that's unknown, right? I mean, like just how these like uh, the, the sensory motor neural systems are, are working to do things like very fine motor control, right? Um, and, and so I think it's a similar issue in the sense that we need very high fidelity sensors, right? We need like a, a large number of them. We need like, um, like uh, very sp like a high specificity on the neurons that we're targeting inside the brain as well. I mean, there's like billions of them, right? So <laughs> it's, uh, it's a, a very tall order. And that's why I think uh, it's such an exciting endeavor as well. Um, and I mean, the, like, there, I, I, you know, I, I did research in non-invasive, uh, like, brain-machine interfaces, too, where you put, like, EEG caps on and, like, like try and, like, control things, and the thing is, it, it all comes down to that signal fidelity, right? It's just, with, with non-invasive systems, especially over your brain, it's just, it's really bad, um, and it's, like, the latency is really bad, like, the, the signal-to-noise ratio is really bad, and you just can't do, um, like, uh, you know, the, the tasks that you wish you could do, like, you know, mind control, Jedi mind tricks over everything, right? Uh, and so I think the, the invasive techniques are, are much more promising. Um, there's still a long way to go. I mean, uh, like, e even with like the, the demos where you're like typing on a computer, that's still like much slower um, in, in a lot of senses than um, like you could use you know, your own sensory motor systems to do, but it's definitely a good start. And I think there's going to be vast improvements on this, especially with companies like Neuralink or like working on this and, and research institutions like University of Chicago and University of Pittsburgh making huge strides in this area. Um, I do wonder problem with neuroscience is that it's kind of an Eldorado that very few people have access to. And uh, some of the scientists are working to make it more accessible. Um, like Greg Gage with his company Backyard Brains, um, where, where he actually creates um, some of the basic um, interfaces where people can play um, in the schools and you know learn more about neuroscience. And one of those um, hardware is called Open BCI Cap. I don't know if you're familiar with that. Um, and they'd have almost like 57 or some um, electrodes. 
But um, I've talked to um, Harrison Canning. He was on my show also. He's a student at Rochester and Institute working just on that. Uh, but the fidelity is really bad. What's I mean, what can we actually do to have electrodes with high fidelity, more cheaper um, and accessible to a lot of people? Yeah, that's, um, I mean, yeah, that's tricky because, um, I mean, and we, we used OpenBCI and like we're, we love uh, a lot of the things that they're doing too. But I mean, again, like I think, I think what it comes down to, there's just a, like a physical limitation in, in the, the ability to just record um, superficially, like, like, uh, like, outside um, of the, the human body, right? Um, in terms of accessibility, I mean, I think that's a fantastic question. And I, 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 we don't know yet because the technology is not even there yet. It's not even at a, a commercial stage yet as, as far as going invasive goes, right? Like if we're talking about like an implant, um, I mean, I, I don't even know like what the Medicare codes would be for like a neural implant and I, they don't, because they don't exist yet, right? Um, and so it's all uncharted territory and it's gonna be really interesting to, to navigate this and see how the companies like Neuralink are, are leading the charge on like how they, I mean, their plan is to make it accessible too, right? Like make it, make like the things like this equitable across um, people and and just to see how they they intend to do it as well as uh, like um, it's it's going to be enlightening. <laughs> um, I don't know if that's a ridiculous idea, but can neural uh, neuroscience labs work as co-working spaces? You know, where people can actually come in, use the instrument under supervision. That probably would make it more accessible. If you were someone who had this neuroscience lab, what would be your prime um, argument against that? So you know. Um, well, I mean, anything invasive, I mean, it's, it's difficult to just like have anyone like, like join it. Right. But anything or non -invasive. Non -invasive. yeah, so non-invasive that the very entry there is, is way lower. Right. And I mean, when we started building our, our own hand, um, we, and, and our, our like own muscle sensing systems, we were using things like Arduino. Right. And Arduino has been like incredible to like lowering the barrier for um, like open source, like designs. And we have an open source version of our hand too, that, that uses like, um, at Arduino based systems like the, like the Teensy. And uh, I think given those types of tools, um, it's easy for anyone to, to, to just jump in and, and like uh, learn this stuff. So for example, if you wanted to build like an EMG sensor, I mean, it's very easy to find um, like um, uh, a circuits online that you can just, uh, you know, buy components for and then build them, but also um, at a, at a, um, more like at a higher level, you can buy kits, right? Uh, like, like I think MyAware is one of them that you can buy on SparkFun for like 50 bucks that allows you to do like EMG control. And then you can uh, connect that to like, you, you know, a, a robotic hand that you were 3D printing yourself uh, with like, you know, cheap hobby motors and things like that. So um, I definitely think that the barrier to entry to this stuff has been lowered. And that's one of the reasons why there is a lot more startups now that you're seeing in like the robotics and the prosthetics and the, the neuroscience space coming out. Um, let's pause your neuroscience side and talk a little bit about you as a person. Um, and um, I just wondering, do you, you play guitar of course? Um, and uh, what kind of music do you like? I mean, you better have good sense with this Mohawk. <laughs> um so I, I i my favorite music is probably like um alternative rock from the 90s and the in, in the 2000s so like what uh, are the bands about, like yeah so like nine inch nails and um let's see i'm trying to think of others off the top of my head like deftones and uh, rage against the machine and like system of a down and lincoln park like th those types of bands are i've always been my favorite but i've always been open to um, lots of other genres too. Like I, I enjoy like um, uh, like uh, Chicago speed rap as well, right? Like hardcore, like like gangster rap from Chicago as well. It's, I mean, I, I grew up in in uh, in uh, like you know the Chicago area. I went to school um, in Chicago as well, so uh, that's always had a special place in my heart too. <laughs> I think this whole generation that grew up with LinkedIn, um, you know, they have this kind of similar taste. You know, I've dabbled with a lot of those uh, bands that you talked about also. And I'm just wondering if, when you play yourself, is it more of a lead side or the rhythm side? Um, I, I, it's, it's honestly, it's both. <laughs> it's, uh, I, yeah. Um, and typically when I play, it just gravitates for these like, yeah, 90s alternative rock and like sad love songs. I don't know if they just, they just resonate with me. <laughs> 
And I was just wondering, I see this trend between all the neuroscientists at least that I've talked to, um, and they uh, are very, um, mm, let's say the word would be effervescent, you know, talk about things, you know, very open and jolly and things like this, which I find kind of lacking in the social sciences as you as professors. And I was just wondering, do you, have you had experience of uh, teaching students um, where the cool professor um, like to teach um, things? Because you now I got a bad rap for being the cool professor, you know, get along with students a lot and, you know, um, not that much with the peers. Um, have you had the experience of teaching? Yeah, and so um, when I was, so I went to Loyola University of Chicago for my undergrad. Um, and then um, I, I finished my bachelor's in biology there back in 2007 and got a master's there in 2008 in uh, computer science. And then for two years, I actually taught in the computer science department um, at Loyola University of Chicago. And that was, honestly, it was a ton of fun because um, they let me teach their intro to programming class. And typically the way it was taught when I took that class was um, you would just use like a like a terminal on, on like your, your computer, right? Like the command prompt on Windows. And then you would just like, like code on, on that, right? And then you would just see like text output. And I had always had a mind to want to go into like robotics and, and bionic limbs, right? So um, they gave me the freedom to um, basically revamp the entire curriculum using Lego Mindstorms robots. And so uh, we would put Java on these Lego Mindstorms robots and then they would learn Java from scratch on these devices and then actually make like, you know, the motors move and the sensors work and, and how you could build like, um, like cognitive systems that, the, that like could uh, like, you know, play, like do sumo bot competitions and things like that, right? Where you try to like find the other robot and then push them off like a, like a, a little arena. And that was just so much fun. Um, and I feel like it just made computer science just so much more accessible and engaging to a lot of um, students who, um, you know, weren't necessarily considering that as a line of like, like future work that instead of just like, you know, staring at a computer screen and looking at text output all day, that you can actually build these devices that can actually do fun and cool things, right? Um, so yeah, I, I, I was blessed with that opportunity that I got to uh, teach a lot of those students and, and uh, I, I still keep in contact with some of them and now uh, like several of them are, are like, one of them is like a, a professor, I think she's at Yale now too. And I'm just like, wow, that's really cool. And like, uh, and, and others who are just like are in industry and, I, uh, and they're like, yeah, you were like you know, my, my first introduction to computer science. And I'm just like, wow. Well, that's that's so cool, I, and and I'm just grateful that I had such an opportunity to um, work with these students who are now doing great things. Yeah, I think one of the things um, we're teaching is that it's such a fulfilling um, job if you've done that correctly, and you know you build a lot of connections, um, and you get to know about the latest research if your students actually go into those um, fields. And I'm just wondering, have you had the chance to look at OpenAI's hand that I could actually you know um, fix the rubric? Um, cube and that was built on a lot of um, AI that would um, guide the hand if you know the positions are at the correct moment or not. And I'm just uh, thinking if that's something that you're planning to incorporate in your hands for certain activities, um, or is there any room? Because whenever there is data being generated, um, there's certainly room uh, for AI and trying to make sense of you know, general transit patterns. And uh, do you have any component of that at the moment um, in your product? So um, we currently uh, don't have, uh, well, actually, no, we have, we have some like um, automatic processes that the hand does uh, that, are, that are similar to what you're talking about. So for example, one of them is like what we call a contact reflex, right? So when the touch sensor that actually come into contact with an object, it automatically slows down. Um, and the user can adjust like uh, how much they want that to slow down. Um, but it's these, um, it's starting to, um, kind of like uh, go into this phase where it's like um, it's shared autonomy. I think that's the that's the proper term for it, right? So um, the human has control over the hand, but also the hand has its own um, abilities as well that can make things easier um, for the, the human operator to use, right? So this uh, a contact reflex is one example of this shared autonomy, right? So when, when it comes into contact with an object, it automatically like will will stop or like slow down the grasp to give user finer give the user finer control. Another example of that, and this is a a, a paper that we had uh, published like several years ago, was we actually put a camera 
um, in the hand. And then the camera would actually do object detection. And then um, based on the, the object um, that it recognizes, it would select the particular, like the best grasp um, for the user to um, grab that object with so that the user doesn't have to consciously think about, oh, do I need to like switch over to like a tripod grip or do I need to switch over to like a key grip? The camera would do that and all the user would have to do is just close the hand and then uh, pick up the object. Now where that gets kind of tricky is um, where do you, so the most important thing in these human machine interfaces is that the user needs to be able to trust the system, right? Uh, and in order to trust the system, you need to be able to know exactly what it's going to do. Um, and if you don't know what it's going to do, then it's it, that's when uh, things get kind of tricky uh, in that sense, right? If you if you're not certain that you know it's going to grasp the object properly, then you can't trust your your hand to actually do that, right? And so. Um, I think there still needs to be a lot of work in how do you navigate like uh, having this uh, AI control, like the AI on the hand, like do its own um, control over itself, whereas everything is uh, controlled from the humans. And that's uh, one of these interesting research areas that I think is going to be pretty cool over the next several years. I think uh, one of the um, experiments that you've already done with the pressure um, is um, this gentleman holding a, an egg without actually breaking it. So, you know, just fine tuning how much pressure you have to put on uh, different objects, uh, which partially probably comes from you know, the sensory feedback as well um, uh, that is embedded in the six sensors and that are in the fingers. Um, we can also talk about um, why didn't you put sensors in the palm? Uh, at least that was uh, the last time I knew. Uh, but, you know, for now, that probably is a pressure um, sensor for now. But I just want one of the components that you can incorporate um, in terms of AI is probably the health for the whole hand using IoT. For example, different sensors send information um, to a, a controller or a Wi-Fi device. We can check, okay, now the sensors are working um, fine or not. You know, what, what is the temperature of that? What is the pressure of that? And things like this. And I was just wondering, have you considered that um, direction um, just for the hand health in general? Sure. And so... Um, uh, with the app, you actually can check on on like the like the the overall health. Like you can see if the pressure sensors are working and things like that. So that that is definitely like that's that's doable. I mean, we're we're doing that um, part already. Um, and uh, yeah, yeah. In terms of um, like like pl placing pressure sensors in um, in different areas in particular, we wanted to first focus on like the the fingertips, right? Because those are the things that interact most with objects, right? So um, in, in fact, in our clinical versions of the hand, it's only on the index finger, the pinky, and the thumb, because those are the three fingers that actually interact most with objects. So um, if for the index finger, if you're making a pinch, for example, uh, we can actually uh, do a key grip. And so on the key grip, here, let me, I can switch over to a key grip, right? So um, the, the thumb is making contact with like the, the side of the finger. And so the thumb is uh, pressure sensors are, are going off whenever I'm touching it right over here, but also the side of the finger, you can feel it there. And then if you rest your hand on a table, then you'll feel it on the side of the pinky um, as well. And so we focused on those three, um, those three digits first in those areas, because we knew that um, those were the ones that come into contact with objects uh, the most. And with a single vibration motor, right, you don't want, uh, I mean, all of that information is getting distilled down into just one vibration, right? It doesn't matter which one you touch, it's just um, one vibration that you're feeling, right? So we're capable of streaming all 30 pressure sensors, all, all 30 touch sensors, the data um, from them. Um, but the question then becomes is, how best do you give that information to the user, right? Um, if you put like a, a bunch of vibration motors around, it's not necessarily that great because then it's like, um, it's very difficult for users to detect like, oh, I'm feeling one vibration here, but now I'm feeling another vibration here. Oh, is that like supposed to be like my, my index finger or my ring finger or like my, 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 my pinky or my palm or like all those different areas. And that's one of the reasons why it's bringing up the, the nerve implants, right? With the nerve implants, you can get that anatomically correct feeling, right, coming from your, your phantom hand if you're missing a hand, right? So um, once we know that we can, um, once we can consistently get those sensations to always feel like, yeah, it's coming from my palm, then definitely we're going to add like sensors on the palm and then, and then um, map that to those stimulations that we might do directly on your nerves to make it always feel like it's coming from a palm. 
Um, and that's why I always uh, I kept saying that we built this hand for you know the clinically available systems that are available now, like a single vibration motor, but also for when those uh, when nerve implants and those future technologies come out as well. I think partially these technologies um, are available. I mean, I don't know if you're familiar with Gil Weinberg at Georgia Tech, um, and he was also featured in um, YouTube um, yeah, Adventures, um, where we actually um, use machine learning to guess what the patient is trying to do with the prosthetic arm. Um, and based on that, you know, if you move your fingers, so there's this guy who, you know, you love to play drums and he does that now with prosthetics. And I was just wondering, have you looked into that research? Was there a specific reason that you did start with the neural um, impulses? Um, do, do you know what's happening? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And so um, from my understanding too, is that the, the work being done at, at Georgia Tech is, is all currently non-invasive, right? So they were using things like ultrasound and, and, and things like that to um, um, control the hand. But the thing is, is that there's still huge barriers, right, to um, making those clinically viable. Um, so things like, you know, getting the, uh, like, uh, ultrasound down to, like, a, a size that's, like, that, that fits on your um, arm mobily, um, as well as, um, you know, dealing with, like, motion artifacts and things like that. Um, and also just the latency, right? I mean, uh, one of the biggest issues that we found was uh, with uh, when talking to users was not just the durability of the like the, of like fingers and things like that, but the 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 delay, the like the amount of time that it takes, like the like the speed with which the the, the fingers move and react. And um, to put things in context, um, with our hand, like um, one of our patients, when we fit them, three minutes after he like wore our bionic hand, like a bionic hand for the first time ever, someone threw him a water bottle. And he was able to catch it because of the a the, the reaction time um, from like the the EMG sensors, but b because our fingers move quickly enough that he was able to actually like do this in real time, like where he was able to like like close the fingers and like it immediately closed as well. Um, so the uh, a lot of the problems with um, non-invasive sensors is that the more sensors you add, the more processing time you add, and then um, uh, the the more processing you have, the less accuracy you can potentially get and the more latency you introduce into the system as well, right? Um, and neural implants, uh, I mean, when, when I started my, my career, they just weren't at the stage that they are now where they've like actually been putting them, uh, them in patients for like, like you know, many years, um, for example. And, uh, and the hardware also had a little bit to catch up with the, the uh, neural impulses as well. And so um, if you have a very slow moving hand, for example, right? And, and we were talking with um, UT Southwestern, um, Jonathan Cheng and Ed Kiefer um, about this too, is that um, the neural impulses, when, when, you're, when you're going directly on the nerve, the latency is much, much lower than the, um, the fingers on uh, other bionic hands at the time were capable of moving. Right, so like the, the user would just be like trying to like move their finger like this, and then they would have to wait like you know a second and a half for the finger to, uh, the robotic hand to go like, eh, right? Um, and then when they saw like our CES demo where the fingers were just like moving like ultra fast, right? Um, they were like, okay, this is like the, the speed with, that we need in order to do this real time control. Um, and that's why we're kind of like excited like that the the hardware is also like catching up to like the the um, uh, the the neur the neural side and then now the neural side is also catching up to like the the individual finger control capabilities of, of bionic hands like ours. Um, let's talk a little bit about your um, work and you have been um, highlighted for that um, in the Latin American um, TV as well in Guatemala and Ecuador. Um, tell us a little bit about how did it go there and you know how many people that has um, helped and certainly a, a little bit about. I mean, I do know that, you know, you're getting uh, funding um, that subsidize uh, the cost a little bit for the patients, but what can we actually do to bring that a little bit down and, you know, how many patients do you have there, um, the whole scenario in Latin America? Yeah, yeah. And so, um, so I actually haven't been to Guatemala yet, but we, we started in Ecuador and the, uh, Ecuador is kind of the, um, like the start of like psionic in, in general as well. And so, um, the story there was that um, back in 2014, um, while I was a graduate student still, um, I got the chance to go down there and work with the Range of Motion Project, and, and they were able to get funding from the U.S. Embassy in Quito to have me and a graduate student um, go down there and fit like one of our early um, 3D printed bionic hands on a patient there. 
And I mean, the thing is, you got to imagine that the size of this bionic hand was like three times the size of an average adult human hand, had wires going everywhere, plugged into breadboards, power supplies, the wall, you name it, right? Um, and our patient, Juan Supio, he had lost his left hand um, 35 years prior due to uh, machine gun fire from a helicopter. He was in the Ecuadorian army and it was a border war between Ecuador and Peru. And so um, uh, he uh, was used to using a prosthetic hand that all it did was just open and close, right? He had never um, used like machine learning or, or like one of these pattern recognition systems to do other um, types of grips. And um, we actually were able to get him to make a pinch with his left hand for the first time in 35 years. And he had actually forgotten how to make a pinch. And we had to retrain his brain in order to remember by placing a, um, uh, a mirror in front of his amputated left side, reflecting his, uh, his uh, natural, uh, his right hand that was still intact. And uh, he would visually look at the mirror, tricking his brain into thinking his left hand was there and then pinch with both hands at the same time. And that uh, was able to like reactivate those muscles uh, enough for our machine learning algorithm then to detect that, oh, okay, he's, he's making a pinch. Um, so now we can make the hand uh, make a pinch as well. And so in front of like international news stations, he was saying that, you know, he felt as though a part of him had come back. And that's when we realized that, you know, if I go the traditional route that I was initially intending, which was to finish my MD and get, uh, uh, and, uh, uh, finish my MD and the PhD and like hold clinic once a week and run an academic research lab, that this would just end up as a university project. This just ends up as a journal paper and that's the end of it. If we wanted everyone to feel the exact same way that Juan did, we needed to commercialize the tech. And so that's when, that's when Psionic was born. And so uh, we've been like, you know, working with uh, the, the Range of Motion project ever since. We'll probably go back down to Ecuador again this year um, to give um, Juan like the latest version uh, of our bionic hand in particular. And, um, and so as we start to increase like our volumes, right, then we can drive like the, the pricing and the cost to go lower um, as well. And then um, with things like the Psionic Foundation that we want to get set up and running, um, then we can subsidize that cost even further to um, get it to individuals um, like Juan in Ecuador and, and, uh, and Guatemala and then India and Pakistan and all of those places too. Could it be the reason that you are um, not able to actually drive your price down? Is it because you're 3D printing it? I mean, what does manual construction look like? Is it cheaper? Um, I mean, we used to have hooks. Uh, before we had prosthetic hands. Um, and <laughs> I don't know what would it actually take um, to make a cheaper one. Um, is manual construction a lot cheaper? I, I just don't know about um, how it works, but what, what can we do to bring the cost down? Yeah, so there are a lot of folks who are doing like straight up 3D printing in particular. Um, and 3D printing, the, the cost, it brings the costs um, down significantly, but the issue with 3D printing is that um, the number one problem that patients have with their prosthetic devices is that they break very, very easily, right? Um, and uh, one of the reasons for that was that the, their joints are, are made of, out of rigid materials, right? Um, so like rigid plastics, regardless of whether it's injection molded, which is even more expensive, well, um, at least the initial setup costs are more expensive um, versus like 3D printed, right? Um, and the, the way that people were breaking these devices, it wasn't um, uh, like they weren't doing anything crazy with it. They would just accidentally like hit their hand against the side of a table and then it would just snap uh, at these joints. Because again, if you look at our own fingers, right? If you, if you like hit this, it actually flexes. There's, there's compliance there. But if this were rigid, then it would like, if you have a force strong enough, it would just break, right? And that's why we, uh, we were looking into other methods that we could still keep things like lower cost than anything else that's out there, um, but uh, take advantage of um, uh, low cost manufacturing like uh, 3D printing. And so what we do is like we 3D print molds and um, we'd have like a, a bone that goes inside um, the, the mold itself and then over mold it with silicone. And that's why these, these fingers are, are flexible and can withstand the impact. And the same thing for the palm, right? This, this is actual carbon fiber um, that's, that's on the palm itself. And that reinforces the 3D printed component that's underneath. And having that durability and that strength is critical to users. That, I mean, if we just gave them like, you know, a, a cheap 3D printed hand, then the problem is that they would break it within like, you know, like a day. Um, and then it's like, then, then how do we support that, right? And then your support costs go up and then like, um, that's, that's a whole another problem in itself. 
And if the hand keeps breaking like like on a weekly basis, then I mean, the, the user is just not going to use it, right? Um, so that's why we, we needed to go through the process of like, how can we make this durable? How can we make it like um, uh, really robust to these impacts? And then as we start to scale this, right, we're, we're gonna like increase our, our, our production over like the, the next year or so. Then, then it's like, okay, we've got like a, a, a scalable, like uh, a massively scalable um, device now, how that will just inherently drive our costs down, drive the price down so that um, we can start hitting places like Guatemala, Ecuador, India, Pakistan, China, those places. And uh, one might ask why, um, I mean, most of those um, amputation happened in the upper extremities, but what about the whole body, um, the legs, um, hopefully not the neck, but um, when you know, <laughs> what, what can you do to actually, you know, um, expand um, the horizon um, beyond just the arms? Yeah, and so a lot of the technology that we built into the, the hand itself, so the motor control technology that allows it to move fast but um, to be strong still, um, are directly applicable to knees and ankles um, as well. And so we're already starting to look into like, how can we make an ability leg in addition to our ability hand, right? Um, how can we make them, them lighter? Like uh, how can we incorporate carbon fiber into them the same way we incorporate carbon fiber into like our, our hands itself? Um, and I have a five-year goal that I want to make a, an ability leg that you can do a triathlon in. Um, and I think that'll just be really cool and, and uh, a really exciting challenge for, um, for all of us in the industry to like go after. Like, uh, and, and honestly, at, at some level, I, I, I think that uh, in, with respect to certain metrics, uh, the, you know, these, these legs and these, these hands will start to like outcompete like what our, what our natural um, limbs can do as well. So perhaps like, you know, with a bionic leg, you might even be able to like run faster or jump higher than you would have um, with your, um, uh, with your natural leg. So um, it'll be really interesting to see where, where those kind of things um, take shape over the next, uh, like, you know, five, 10 years as well. Um, just in a utopian world, you know, I'm thinking out loud here. Um, why um, is that a, that cannot be used um, in some medical conditions that um, render our normal um, biomechanics um, use of like osteoporosis and more neuro disease or multiple sclerosis, uh, where our natural um, body, you know, starts rebelling against us, or let's say um, over the time becomes um, weaker. Can we in some um, way find um, the right moment where we would actually use the prosthetic just before um, you know, the system collapsed totally? It's just like a novel um, idea of how we can help people before they are totally incapacitated. Yeah, you know, that's a, that's a really interesting thought. And I, I, I've never actually thought about that in particular um, on like, uh, like, you know, predicting that uh, you know, you're, you're, you're going to have arthritis or something like that. And so like preemptively, like, um, uh, like, um, doing something like a, um, like a, a joint replacement, um, or if you're talking about like lower limb, like a, a hip or a, a knee, um, replacement, uh, in particular, you know, one of the, I, I think one of the, the tricky things about that too, is that, um, the advantage that the human body typically has is that it can heal itself, right? Um, and but as you get older, you know the, the those abilities um, start to get um, worse too. Um, and I think one of the the critical things in making those types of like um, like uh, devices e even better will be you know, like self healing materials. And I know there's a lot of research that's going into like self healing materials where like, for example, if, if the silicone on here would get like a, a scratch in it, then um, the like there would be neighboring like silicone packets that can just like fill up that area and then like close it back up, right? Um, and at the University of Illinois, there's several professors who are doing that in many institutions. Um, around the, like the world are working on self-healing materials. And I think that will be um, kind of a game changer because that's, that's what our body is doing, right? When, when you get a cut on your skin, right? It's, it's like sending like cells out to the area to like repair like your white blood cells or repair, or repair um, like your skin. And then it's constantly shedding itself um, with, with new, um, to make new skin cells. Um, I think when prosthetics get to that level too, 
um, then we're really going to be at like a, a new golden age of prosthetics, like or, or human machine interfaces where the machine can also heal itself while, while the human is also healing themselves as well. Um, remind me why cannot we use in cadaver hands just like we have donated eyes um, and heart transplants um, and kidney transplants, why does it not work? Yeah, so uh, hand transplants are actually being done. Um, there there uh, are several patients around like the, the world who have gotten uh, hand transplants. The biggest issue there is just um, your, your body rejecting um, the, the transplant uh, in particular. And so um, I, I, I forgot what the statistic is on like the longest uh, a person has had a, a transplant for that's like still functional. I think it's only been like a, a couple of years. Um, or something like that. And or at least in most cases, it's only been like a year or, or two um, that the, the transplant um, has like survived. Um, and part of the biggest issues with that, or issue with that as well is that you have to be on immunosuppressant like drugs basically for the rest of your life um, if you want that transplant to, to um, still work. Um, and uh, I mean, then that just opens you up to like, I mean, we're in the middle of a pandemic, right? If you're immunocompromised during a pandemic, then, then you've got like, uh, uh, like the, the much bigger problems than just like, you know, your, your hand being transplanted, right? Uh, and uh, so it's, it's just not, it's not there um, just yet. Um, and the, the other thing, uh, I mean, to, to consider as well as, um, I mean, with, um, with prosthetics is again, like, um, there is the ability to augment um, your, natu your natural capabilities as well, right? That you couldn't necessarily do with a transplant um, in particular. So, uh, you know, like we, uh, if you put our hand on a wrist rotator, you can like rotate your wrist 360 degrees, right? Like that's like a superhuman ability, right? Like the fact that I can like hit these fingers with a hammer and, and they're totally fine, right? Like, um, like those types of things that, um, you know, with just our natural bodies, we can't do. Um, and I think it's exciting to kind of see like where this, I mean, it's almost like a, a next step in evolution, right? Like uh, how we merge with like machines and incorporate them into our, our bodies. A bit of an Iron Man, um, you know, capabilities with your um, hands. And I'm just wondering, um, apart from Bluetooth and uh, Wi-Fi, what else can be actually added into that? Um, I don't know, some kind of messaging as well. You know, you can put the tactile screen on that um, touch screen and then, you know, have commands or do anything with that. It, it, has that crossed your mind? Yeah, so we actually plan on putting a, a touch screen on like the next version of our, our power switch so people would be able to interact with it. Almost like it, it's like a bat computer, right? So like when Batman like uses his like a uh, little computer on there um, and, you know, integration with like smartwatches, um, I think that's going to be uh, pretty, uh, uh, pretty cool, right? Then um, a lot of the functions that our smartwatches can do, like, you know, like they have like, like Samsung or Google Pay or Apple Wallet built in, right? Um, and uh, like, uh, like, you know, checking your calendar and like uh, reading emails and sending text messages and, and all of that, right? And being able to just control that using like your, your muscles and gestures to like be the interface to it. Yeah, I think that's going to be really exciting and really cool um, to, to do. One of the fascinating things about neuroscience is that you can do a lot of um, experiments um, that you might think that it's just um, simple paper, but you know, there turns out it has a lot of application. And um, one of those principles is transduction, uh, which that means that you know you can interchange one sense into another. Um, so if I were to code one of the case study um, of this person who actually climbed Mount Everest, uh, named Eric uh, Weinmeier, and the, the feat was made more impressive because he was blind. And what it was he was doing that he had an electrode grid in his mouth um, and uh, he called it brain port. And the grid delivers little impulses to his tongue um, that mirror the visual signals from a camera attached um, to his four steps. So it's kind of a, a, quick, a quick geeky way to um, you know, have the sense back, um, just um, notify it through another sense. And I'm just wondering, do you see a feature in that kind of cross-section and interchangeability of a different senses from taste to hearing um, to touching uh, to seeing. Yeah, you know, it's, so that's also very tricky as well. And so the, the reason is, is because um, 
in in like a multimodal plasticity right that's that's like the term for what you're talking about right when you when you have um a deficit in one sensory area and then other sensory areas that kind of take the place of that right um it works because there is a deficit in, in your, your brain structure for that particular area. And it allows um, the, the neurons from neighboring areas to kind of grow into um, that space. Um, and there's, uh, when you still have those capabilities, the, the plas uh, like the plasticity of your brain is, is more limited than we might tend to think, right? And so, uh, for example, there was a there's a great paper by um, uh, recently from uh, Sleeman Ben Smyatt at University of Chicago and Max Ortiz Catalan um, from uh, the Center for Bionics and Pain over at um, I think Salgrenska University in um, Sweden, and um, they were showing that um, they they had like I think it was like a patient with an amputation, and they were like stimulating the the nerve for um, the like the um, that corresponded to like their ring finger versus their middle um, finger um, with touch sensation. So when you when you touch them on their middle finger, they would actually stimulate your ring finger. And um, with your when they touch the ring finger, they would stimulate your middle finger. And they wanted to see if that would actually like your brain would like rewire itself into thinking that okay now now I'm touching my ring finger even though I'm stimulating my middle finger, my brain will still interpret it as a ring finger. And it didn't happen. Um, and the, the brain just could not like, even after like, like a year and a half of doing this or something like that, it just did not rewire itself. So, um, I think there's still a lot that needs to be learned about how, like, when exactly is the brain plastic, right? Like in what situations can it actually take over those areas and remap, um, certain, uh, like sensations to other sensations, right? Um. And uh, I think we're just scratching the surface on that. And there's a lot more that we need to like, like learn about just the, like, like how the brain processes this type of information before we can like really th do things like, you know, give myself another arm and then like have that actually represented in my brain as having a, a third arm and, or a fourth arm even like Dr. Octopus style, right? Um, then, um, and, and actually having them be functional and incorporated into your body schema as opposed to, you know, you just like wearing a, a jacket and having like another tool um, at, at your disposal. Um, yeah, where it doesn't feel like it's a natural extension of your body. Apart from rewiring, um, there are certain primal instincts of people that has physical manifestation. For example, um, when you see um, a cobra uh, in a park chasing you, you certainly are sweating, you know, your heart rate goes faster, you know, your vital signs start showing that. And none of, um, the real things happen, like Cobra didn't bite you and it's still chasing you um, and you, your um, sympathetic nervous system um, starts firing um, things in you. And that has nothing to do with brain rewiring. So why do you think um, people, when they, they behave um, in a manner where their physical situa situation or health uh, or physiological symptoms change, why does that happen uh, without actually missing some uh, physical part in the brain? Um, so with respect to that, I mean, I think those are like, like hardwired constructs, like, um, that, that, that humans have just like, like been built with, right. The, um, the, in, in, like an innate fear of like, like snakes. And I think, I think spiders or something was like one of them. And like, um, I mean, another, another example of that is, um, I think, what was it like smiling, right. Smiling is ubiquitous, like around the entire world, like uh, that it always means like joy. Right. Um, uh, and and that's, it's different necessarily from um, like, you know, the, the plastic nature of the brain, right? So that we're talking about like um, your brain being like, like hardwired for certain things um, and, and certain capabilities when you're, when you're, um, when you were born um, towards like, as opposed to like your brain completely rewiring itself to like, like um, to completely new experiences and things like that. Um, and uh, yeah, I mean, I, I think evolution probably has a lot to do with it too, like how humans have evolved over time. Um, and I mean, there's perhaps like, you know, as, as evolution continues, we, our, our brains might get those capabilities to um, allow for 
ex like uh, like um, extra numery appendages, right? Like like having an additional thumb or like having like an additional arm or something like that. Um, it's just that the, the science hasn't has like hasn't shown it yet, right? Um, that that we that we're actually capable of doing those things. Um, and it's, I mean, I, I think it's exciting to think about those those uh, possibilities, but we also got to keep them like grounded in like what what is actually possible at, um, with these types of like sensory substitution systems. Um, they they work to an extent, but we don't know enough yet to how we can actually make them work effectively on a, on a natural basis that our brain actually incorporates these like new paradigms into like our actual body schema. Talking about science that we don't understand, um, you are also a parent, um, a kind of science that no one understands <laughs> because you know, kids, <laughs> kids are probably the most enigmatic puzzles um, you can ever have. You have a four-year-old and, and a six-year-old um, how's the neuroscience going with them? You know, it's it was it's been really cool to see them just like uh, acquire knowledge, right, o over time and just like come alive with their own personalities and everything, right? I mean, especially at, at this young an age, right? Because because like the first like several years uh, uh, of their life, you know, they're uh, you you don't really see that personality. You see glimpses of it, right? But now that they're like six and four, it's just like yeah like you can see where their interests are lying and so like like zane loves building like building things with legos and doing like like engineering type things and like math and science and and uh, and zara she loves like reading and and um and she's just starting to like learn to read too and uh, zane is my my six-year-old son uh, and then zara is my my four-year-old daughter and um just to see them come into their own element and just to see their development i mean from a neuroscience perspective as well it's just like incredible, right? I mean, I remember like the, the day that Zane was born and I was just like looking at, at his hands, right? And I was like, you know, we can build like the, the most sophisticated bionic hand in the world right now, but it still cannot even do what like this, this hand as a one-year-old, like is, is, or sorry, not one year, a one-day-old, one-day-old. Uh, is able to do and I was just like it, it's just it's just incredible what the human body is capable of. Um, I think it's a little bit early but you have you had um, any inclinations um, or intuitions about what Z and Z might want to do in their lives what their passions are and does it come you from know, you or your wife or <laughs> you know I think it's way too early to tell and and um, uh, and I I am I think one of the most exciting things about seeing them grow up is to see where their own passions will lie and how it's going to change um, over the future too, right? I mean, um, we'll, we'll see. I mean, like in, in high school and college, I mean, that's that's really where I feel like you, you kind of like start to um, see, you know, get more of a sense of purpose and get more of a sense of like what, what um, you really want to do with your life. I mean, but I mean, that being said, I mean, I, I know people even who are like my age or even older than me that that are still trying to, to figure that out as well. So, um, yeah, I mean, it, that's that's part of the journey of life. Right. Um, just not knowing where it might take you. I never intended to start a business like that was never like in my um, in my trajectory as as like a, a child. I, my plan was to become a, an MD. Right. Like working with patients. Uh, and my, my goal was to work with patients with amputation and develop limbs like this. It just turned out that the the way we could have the most impact in doing that was to start a company um, and do the research through uh, through a company and, and get this to as many people as possible, as opposed to doing it necessarily through like a, a, a academic institution or a research institution. So um, yeah, you don't necessarily know what route like life will take you. And so I think having that ability to be open to it and adapt um, is, is pretty critical. And I think that's one of the most important things that I want for my kids too, is that um, to be able to adapt to those types of situations and, and you know, roll with the punches that life throws at you. I think it's very liberal and kind of frankly unorthodox in parents that, you know, they give this opportunity and free hand to their children what they want to become. And I read a book, a question time ago called Coming Apart by Charles Murray. And he talks about uh, the American cultural transition from 1960s onwards. And um, he talks about the liberal parents who generally have a very strict curriculum for what the child's going to be. You know, the, the music classes and the sports and the good grades to get into um, Ivy League to become a doctor and you know, get a mortgage at this <laughs> age. <laughs> you know, luckily you don't have that. You know, I think your children are very 
and lucky. Um, one of the things that I um, experienced in your work, um, and, and frankly, I admire this a lot in a lot of people because academics can become very annoying and arrogant, that you thank everyone um, in the journey. That's like two page long um, acknowledgement in your <laughs> dissertation about your life and, you know, random people that, you know, I wouldn't even think that you know, they have kind of collaborated. Um, do you think it's really important um, to share the credit with a lot of um, people? Because generally when people have something and, you know, they have um, a privileged position, they're going to forget all the latter steps that they've taken. What do you think about that? Yeah. And, you know, I think one of the most important things about like, especially like an entrepreneurial journey um, as well, or honestly just life is to come from a position of gratitude. Um, so I'm incredibly grateful for like every opportunity and every every person that I've met that has helped me to get uh, me where I am, right? And I know that like, I, I would not have been able to do this solo, right? Um, like if it wasn't for like, you know, my my wife, like, I mean, she is my biggest supporter, right? And and a, running a startup is like, it, it's no joke, right? I mean, it's a complete roller coaster ride. And I remember like, um, back in like uh, 2017, when we came back from China, for example, right? Um, we we like we're trying to do an Indiegogo campaign at that point. We wanted to raise like hundred fifty thousand uh, dollars on an Indiegogo campaign, and we only raised like six thousand dollars, right? And which is nowhere near the goal that we were trying to to hit. And then by the end of that year, we had like two hundred dollars left in our bank account. And then fortunately, we were able to get our first grant from like the National Science Foundation that gave us like two hundred thousand two hundred dollars like the following week, like in the first week of January. And I was just like wow like we go from like having like the least amount of money we've ever had to like the most amount of money we've ever had in, in a single week right in, in 2017 and um you know to have a a wife that kind of supports me through like the you know these like ups and downs and like um and she you know believes in everything that i'm doing too i mean that that kind of like uh you know support you you can't uh, you can't take for granted right i mean that and that's why, you know, like, that's why I'm so grateful for like every person along the way who has like um, had, had the peace in like the success that we've had, right? Um, yeah, it's been, it's been fairly critical. You know, um, I am on advisory boards of a lot of um, startups when I talk to a lot of people um, at C-Suite and I can tell you for sure that very few people would be standing by you when you have $200 to your bank. And um, luckily you spring back from this, which is such an inspirational story. And um, I was just wondering from that moment to actually Medicare approving um, your prosthetic hand, how, how did that journey end about? It's quite you know, a task to get it approved um, by Medicare. What happened there? Yeah, and so that was, so, okay. We started 3D printing all, all our, our prosthetic hands and then we start uh, like, it was probably around like 2015 or so. Um, that we are talked with like hundreds of patients and clinicians. And uh, we went through this process called like, it's, it's referred to as customer discovery, where we find out what the actual pain points are um, of potential end users um, and like the, who the stakeholders are, right? So the clinicians and the patients, right? The, the, the clinicians being the ones who actually fit the hand to the users and then the, the patients being the ones who are actually going to use the hand. And you know that's where we found out that the number one issue that they had was that the, the hands were breaking all the time, right? Um, the another big issue was for, for them, uh, and this is something that the clinicians echoed, was that you know coverage for these things, like an advanced bionic hand, it was only covered by um, the military or if you had a workplace accident uh, in most cases, right? And that was only about like ten percent of the market. That was only about ten percent of patients in the U.S. could afford like an advanced bionic hand with that was multi-articulated and can move um, individual fingers. And um, they all said that all the clinicians were like, if you can get it covered by Medicare, then that would be huge. And so that was one of our design constraints. That was that we had to make sure that we were not going to build a hand that was so expensive that Medicare wouldn't cover it um, at all. And that was one of the, the ways that like uh, the reasons why we had to kind of think outside of the box, like not using traditional manufacturing methods like injection, like plastic injection molding and, and things like that, but rather how could we leverage 3D printing, which is low cost still, um, to make the hand A more robust, but B still low cost enough that Medicare would actually 
cover and that's when we were like oh we can 3d print molds and, and like use you know uh, rubber and silicone and like low cost materials to uh, make the, the fingers um and so having that mindset from the beginning was was pretty critical to getting that uh the uh, hitting a price point that medicare would actually cover um in, in the u.s and so we actually went through um it, it's called pdac is the approval that you need in order to um uh, uh, like have it uh, covered under Medicare. And so like last year was when we had um, gone through that PDAC approval and, and um, gotten this uh, actually approved by uh, Medicare for reimbursement. And um, the uh, that was more so like, you know, testing, making sure that functionally it's doing everything that it, it says according to the codes that Medicare has. But the biggest thing was actually targeting that price point that Medicare would actually cover. And that was like the, the, the most important thing. What do you think are some of the roadblocks um, in taking um, cyanic prosthetic arm global? Um, one of the places that I've lived in, um, which probably has a better um, GDP than the US, which would be able to afford um, those hands in Scandinavia. Um, and the population is extremely um, old. And you know, these cases are very common. Do you have hand imputation? And I'm just wondering, uh, do you have some patent protections um, or regulatory um, restrictions that would um, stop you from going global? Or do you have any plans to explore that market? Um, how does an international outlook look like? Yeah, and so we're currently working on getting our CE mark so that we can um, start uh, to uh, get the hand out there in Europe and, and like Australia and Canada and those places. Um, um, if you could just briefly well, explain about what CE mark is for people who are listening. Uh, yeah, so, yeah, so CE mark is the the regulatory approval that you need uh, in order to distribute like a, a device or any any product in um, in the European Union. Um, and typically, a lot of other countries uh, like follow those standards as well. They have similar standards, like Australia and Canada are fairly similar with that regard um, in terms of getting that that CE mark uh, in particular. Um, and uh, so we're we're looking at targeting probably like the end of this year, or early next year, to be able to. Um, expand into those markets in particular. And I think, uh, honestly, the, um, the biggest challenge, and I, I, was, I was mentioning this before, isn't necessarily getting our hand out to um, uh, these places like globally, e even, even in like the, the developing nations. I think what's even more critical is having that infrastructure to provide that continuous care, because it's not like we can just like be like, you give someone a hand and be like, all right, you've got a hand now, you're, you're set for the rest of your life, right? Um, there's a lot of like physical therapy, occupational therapy, like rehabilitation, like working with your prosthetist, like socket fit, like like those types of things, that ongoing care that's, that's very critical to the success um, of, of these patients um, going forward and really being able to utilize these devices, not just ours, but any prosthetic device, whether it's a leg or a hand or a, or a full arm or, um, and, I think those are also barriers that need to be like very carefully considered um, before we, you know, embark like on an international campaign on like getting these hands to as many people as possible. Um, and that's why it's so critical for us to work with these nonprofit organizations that can provide that continuous care in those countries, like with, with their own people themselves, um, so that, uh, you know, it's not just like, like a like a savior type thing like oh yeah we're, we're gonna like just drop a hand here and then like yeah you're 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 set like we are saving the world because of that um it's not it's not as simple as that yeah i can certainly see you know what the problems might be and one of the problems itself is it's getting even they're very spoiled when it comes to product quality and um the issue with one issue with prosthetic arms um is generally the infection mitigation process and you have a CAD model uh, where you talk about the design, how you would uh, mitigate the risk of infection uh, with that. Tell us a little bit about um, how does that work and what are generally the problems um, that happen when you have prosthetic arm uh, for um, quite some time on you? Yeah, and so so just to just to distinguish here, um, so typically when you fit this hand, there's nothing invasive of, of, about uh, about this guy at all, right? So there's not really any issues with like infection. So this would go go on like a residual limb and then you have a socket with embedded electrodes that would go on the outside um, of your skin. So one of the things that we're working on as well is, so imagine if you're missing like your, your finger, right? Um, we're working on a particular surgery that can integrate 
um, uh, like a, a prosthetic finger directly to your bones and to your tendons. So your, your residual like flexor tendon on the palm side and your residual like extensor tendon on the dorsal side um, of your hand. And uh, the, the tricky thing there is that, you know, you've got a, an artificial tendon that's sutured onto your residual tendon, and that's going to be like traveling, like, like back and forth, like, right, like inside and outside of the body potentially, right? Um, and so uh, we've been working on methods that we can reduce that, the potential of like foreign pathogens to go uh, inside the body uh, by uh, having like an external tendon that interfaces with like the, the internal tendon um, and then sealing off that like external part so that no uh, foreign bodies can actually enter into the system. And that way you can have a, a prosthesis that's driven by your muscles, right? That gives you like a, a sense of like where your fingers are positioned and like how much strength you're, you're providing on them um, with no need for a battery. And um, if something happens to the outside of that finger, you can just replace the finger itself. Um, and so that's some of the, like the, the cool technology that, that we're also developing simultaneously, um, along with the robotic technology as well. Um, talk a little bit about um, how, um, how electronic, um, or let's say humidity proof that is, like if you put that in um, arm or if, you, if that's raining or if it's sweating, and does it actually interfere with electrical components? Uh, how does it work? Yeah, so this is uh, this hand is uh, waterproof up to the wrist, um, and so when we when the hand gets dirty or anything, we actually just tell our users just go to the sink and wash it like you would wash like your natural hand, um, and with like with soap and water. And we're working on a, a version that's um, that's waterproof beyond the wrist um, as well. Um, and so because we've sealed all those areas off, we haven't had. I mean, th there's no issues with the uh, with the electronics getting wet. Um, beyond the, the wrist, then uh, there's still some like, you know, circuitry here that um, can still like be susceptible to like, like um, issues with getting wet, for example. Uh, but uh, I mean, there's still, if you have a socket that's going over your residual limb, um, you're going to have problems with like getting water and it's not a water, you can't make it a waterproof seal because you, you can't seal it to your body <laughs> in a way that's waterproof as well. Right. So when things like, um, bone integrated implants and, and, um, like nerve implants come about where it's like inside your body and your skin is acting as that barrier, I think that will be kind of like the, the next step in like, you know, getting the hand to a level where, you know, you could swim with, for example, or like go, go like, like diving. Um, and uh, once those um, technologies, like the invasive ones, like come up, um, where again, it's going to be exciting to see like what new things that people will be able to do with their prosthetics that they wouldn't that they weren't able to do ever before. One of the things um, that it does is that you know from your impulses, um, it can guess um, what part of the finger you want to move, or let's say part of the hand you want to move. What if you reverse that process and, and use the same technology that you have in the variables in that hand itself? So what I mean is, for example, can it um, measure your vital signs, um, your heartbeat, um, your um, skin temperature, and things like this, and use that, for example, in older patients to transfer that information um, to healthcare providers to find out, okay, well, something's going on with that person. So it's kind of an intersection between the variables um, and the prosthetics. Do you have this... Um, can you envision a product that would you know combine both of them? Yeah, and so uh, one of the things I was mentioning was was kind of having like that smartwatch um, capabilities, right? And so like Apple watches can can do that, right? They can like detect your like heart rate and then like detect arrhythmias, right? Um, it's like FDA approved now, I think, for detecting arrhythmias. Um, and then like, you know, let you know to like contact like your doctor about like something abnormal, right? Um, I, so I definitely see that being integrated, especially, I, it wouldn't necessarily be on the hand side itself. It would have to be like, a, a, like, like more like, like on, on the body itself, right? Because the hand is, is like, I, I can't put like a temperature sensor on the hand that detects like your skin temperature because it's not touching it, right? Um, but like, for example, where the power switch lies, right? Um, we might be able to like, uh, or the, the muscle sensors, right? We can, in the muscle sensors, we could potentially integrate like other types of sensors too that could detect like, like conductive, like, uh, like skin conduction and like, um, uh, and, and like heartbeat and things like that. And I think that would be, that would be like cool to give you like a, 
a holistic view of your health um, in, in addition to just like how uh, how your hand is, but like your entire body. Yeah, that's that's definitely an area that I see this kind of tech going in the future. Talking a little bit about nickels and dimes here. Um, as we speak, there are other companies who are also making prosthetic um, arms and and do you see how do you do you have a plan to actually you know beat um, your competitors for for example one of those is Calarm uh, which is um, made by an um, Indian uh, Forbes um, leader you know he's just listed as um, Forbes um, 30 best um, leaders in India and the arm actually costs 2500 dollars um, and it does a lot of um, functions that you do um, and the company is called Maker's Height. And I was just wondering, are you worried about uh, some of the low cost um, competition uh, in your realm and do you, do you have a backup plan? Yeah, so, uh, so again, this, this touches on one of the things I was talking about earlier that, that if you go with 3D printing, you can make things like significantly cheaper, right? And we started that way too, right? The, the problem with 3D printing though, is that you give that to a patient and, and people are like guaranteed going to like break it very, very easily. The most important thing is for the hand to be durable from all of our, all the conversations that, that we've had. And, um, and I, I think, um, I think it's great that a lot of these um, a lot of these companies are coming are, are 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 popping up and like trying to solve a lot of these 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 problems with like expensive prosthetic designs and but what we've seen is that um, even with a lot of people who have been using like three printed hands originally they've contacted us directly saying like hey I got this like three printed hand and I I thought it was going to be really good but then like you know it's breaking down all the time it doesn't have like these, these it doesn't give me like touch feedback it doesn't give me like like X Y and it's too slow it's like it, it can't like move like uh, like all the fingers or like uh, all, all of that uh, stuff right the socket doesn't fit well right um and those you can't you can't really come at the you can't really find out about those problems strictly coming at it from an engineering perspective right you have to like have the patients involved and not just a single patient but like as many patients as possible to really find out what those those pain points are. And I mean, the, the thing is, is that we designed this hand to do things that other bionic hands absolutely cannot do, right? So like, like, like breaking boards with it, right? Like um, doing push-ups on it, like arm wrestling with it, bottle flips, right? Like if you remember that trend from like, like a couple of years ago where you take like a, a, a half empty like bottle of water and then like you flip it and you try to get it to land. Uh, you can imagine that's harder with a bionic hand. And like, we just released a video on YouTube showing like one of our users doing this like all around our lab. And it was just a lot of fun and a really exciting to see what kind of like um, the dexterity that you can achieve with these with these um, like you know more advanced technology that's that's coming out there. So honestly, as, as long as we keep going after these these more like grand challenge type things, right? Like these these like crazy like cool like 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 ideas that you can do that require this this level of dexterity that that has not been available before. I think then um, we'll always be pushing like the, the market forward and we'll always be like, like relevant to um, the prosthetic space. Do you think pressure sensing is really the deal breaker here? I mean, you also have four patents in which you have a very um, far design of how the hand's supposed to work. Um, do you think that's, um, that's an edge that's going to sustain over long um, periods of time and that's not easy to replicate, but it's more like a Taiwanese company producing microchips um, and no one else in the world <laughs> kind of you know, is able to match that production level or quality level, including China. Uh, do you think uh, it's good enough or are there any um, plans in the pipelines that are going to take you, at, you know, a notch above where you are? Yeah, I mean, we're, we're always constantly working on things to, to improve the hand, right? So, I mean, one is just like, uh, and this is one of the things you mentioned, right? Putting pressure sensors in other places, right? So like, um, especially as the, the the invasive stuff catches up, right? Um, then we can start asking like those those like even crazier questions. Should, can we do like like um, splitting the, the fingers apart, for example, right? Can we um, uh, then start doing things like, you know, playing piano? And, and, and I know that like, there's some videos that have shown um, like users playing piano, but it's not, it, it, 
it is not actually like like really playing piano, right? I'm talking about like being able to like type like like normally and like play piano like you would um, normally, not just like you know one key at a time, like two seconds uh, with a two second delay, right? Like not like that. Um, and uh, those are the types of like grand challenges that we have in our heads that we see a clear path on how we can get there with things like nerve implants and, and um, like the engineering that we want to put into um, the hand itself. And I think one of the things that gives us an edge in that um, realm is that we come from an academic research perspective as well, right? So I, I did a PhD in this. I know exactly where the state of the art is um, based on um, like all the research papers that I've read from every other research group that is that is in this space, right? Um, it's small enough that that it's it's um, it's possible to. I mean, you know, every single player in the field, like like every every person knows um, everyone else in the academic spheres, um, and uh, because of that, we we're not building the hand necessarily for just today, right? We're we're building the hand so that. The, for, for tomorrow when like the researchers like have like all these tools. So for example, um, um, a lot of universities are starting to um, uh, purchase our hand too because we've got an API, like a, a programming interface for it that you can control like the position, the velocity, the torque of every single one of our six um, motors that are in here and stream all 30 pressure sensor, all, all 30 touch sensors over Bluetooth or over a USB connection um, to your computer and then do whatever kind of processing you want with that. And for them to be actually have that capability that you can't really do with any of the other bionic hands, I mean, that enables them to really also push the entire field forward. And then like, um, and then, uh, you know, we can commercialize that technology too once it's ready. And then they've already been using it with our hands. So it's like, it makes it a seamless transition into the future. And that gives us an edge over a lot of the other companies that are kind of just solving what they're seeing as a problem now but then five years from now, um, they, they haven't really addressed those problems then. What do you like to read when you're not doing neuroscience? Or do you, do you, are you into fiction? Do you have more of an um, artistic side to you also, or you're just a scientist? <laughs> Well, so the artistic side, I think, is is definitely like in, in playing guitar and like like rapping and singing and things like that. Um, in terms of what I like to read, um, let's see. I think um, wh one of my favorite books that I had read recently was um, Shoe Dog uh, by Phil Knight, the um, the the founder of uh, Nike. And man, I I resonated with that hardcore, right? Like all the struggles that he went, he was going through to like get his startup like uh, up and running back when it was like Blue Ribbon Sports, um, all the way to Nike. That like I, I even had like uh, my my wife read it too because it was just like like and just, I feel like oh my goodness, this is like this is a life we're living right now, right? And then she read it and she was like, oh my goodness, this is the life we're living right now. <laughs> and uh, yeah, I mean. That I found that book in, in particular um, inspirational. I think another one that I'd read recently was um, what is it? The the I can't remember the the name of the, the book, but it was the Theranos um, one about like Elizabeth Holmes and and how um, uh, how that like you know all, all, everything that was going on and that was just like you know almost like a mystery suspense type book right like a, a thriller that but it's nonfiction. um so i know i've been i've been gravitating a lot more towards um those books recently that are kind of like about like um startups and like how you build these things and but like real world like um like stories and not just like you know inspirational stuff that's just like um you know these are the tips that you should do but like the actual like like failures that have happened and and what to watch out for. <laughs> if there will be one takeaway from the book, what would you say um, is that, that that does it for you? Uh, say, say that one more time. Uh, if there's only one takeaway that you have to take from the book um, to overcome all the struggles and vicissitudes, um, what do you think that would be? Yeah, honestly, it's that you have to have grit. You have to be able to just persevere when the lows are low um, and in order to achieve those high highs. And that's like, that's how it goes with a startup, right? Like I said, it's a roller coaster, right? You, you're always like oscillating. And as long as that, that general trend is going upwards, then that's, that, that's good. But you're going to hit like those, those low lows and to actually have the perseverance and grit to get through um, that to get the, the higher reward at the end. I think that's probably the biggest takeaway um, out of that.
Um, I guess the, if I were to add one more thing on that is to have integrity. Um, so um, like, like being true about like what you're, what you're selling and what your capabilities are and things like that, because uh, you don't want to end up like fair enough, right? Yeah, it's kind of <laughs> hard to match both of them. <laughs> <laughs> okay. Um, and do you, do you plan to go public at some point? I mean, are you actively seeking for the venture capitalist fund? Do you also have like a roadmap of uh, what would you do with your funds? What's what lies ahead of Psionic? Yeah, so um, we're, we're probably going to raise another investor round um, fairly soon, probably in the next couple of months. Um, we we really want to um, start to like expand our production because um, uh, right now there's a, there's a lot of demand um, for our hand. Um, and we want to be able to meet that um, production wise. So that's, um, that's one of the things we're looking into and really expanding some of those other R&D projects like an ability lag um, that I was mentioning. And um, also that uh, the, the um, artificial tendon implants um, that we're working on to just really build out those. So um, we're raising around to uh, kind of expand and, and um, uh, get those up and running as well. And so the exciting, for, or the, um, the future for Psionic is just really exciting. And it's just, uh, it's, probably the, the most exciting time in the company that we've ever had. Um, Ariel, you have helped hundreds and hundreds of people um, over the years, some um, veterans, grandmothers, young people um, able to live a life um, that um, they deserve. Um, but unfortunately, they got into an accident. And um, I assume that you receive a lot of love mail um, from people or around um, the globe for the work that you're doing. Um, do, you, do you often f think about that, um, the kind of impact that you, you're having on people who otherwise wouldn't be able to live a uh, fulfill, fulfilling life? 100%, I mean, that's, that is the reason why we do what we do, right? Um, is, is for the, the people with um, limb differences. And um, yeah, uh, like, that, uh, I mean, I, I'm grateful that I have the opportunity to, to even help them, right? Um, and uh, to give them like the, the, um, the abilities to do the things that they wanted to do again. And so for like, like um, Dan St. Pierre, or the, the uh, triathlete, um, like for him to be able to like, you know, work out with that, that side of his hand for the, the Tina Brockett, the, um, the grandmother you're mentioning who got to feed her granddaughter like for the first time using a can. I mean, again, those are, it's those moments that make all the low lows and the like the 80 hour, 80 to 82 hour work weeks worth like doing everything that we do. And it's such an uplifting story um, uh, that started in um, rural Pakistan, I believe. Um, and uh, the summit or pinnacle of it in, in, in your view is a grand vision about making a bionic institute. Um, and we also see um, a lot of disconnect, um, like you said, um, that also inspired you to do something practical between academia and industry. So there's a lot of gaps. You know, some people, you know, um, live their life um, for the pride of publishing, but you know, you took it to the next level and helped people who are suffering. Um, how does the institute look like? Um, what would you need for that? Uh, and what's your plan for that? Yeah, so yeah, my my grand vision would be to like run like a bionics institute that's like a public private partnership essentially, right? So a lot of like the for example like the the partial finger uh, implant thing that we're working on, right? We need clinical partners um, to to do that, right? That we, we can't just do that all um, in house. So um, one of the that's one of the core advantages of a clinical institution like an academic institution is that they're able to do those they have the infrastructure built to do like those types of clinical trials um, and, and such right um, and then um, to be able to partner with them but then actually commercialize the technology and make it accessible I think that has always been like the key that's been missing right because the research in this field has been like phenomenal right like the like the things that people have been able to do in prosthetics like in the research side for like the last like 50 years has been like incredible but the 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 commercial technology available does not match what's what's capable like the capabilities on the, the research end um and we kind of we learned how to bridge that gap right so this started off as like an academic like um like in an academic institution while i was doing my phd but then we actually learned how we can actually commercialize this technology and make it accessible right um 
so we want to do that at an even larger scale, right? Like, like um, have patients like come into this bionics Institute to get like, you know, the surgeries done, but then also get the devices and also have like the rehab and like uh, all of that. Right. So with this bionics Institute would basically become like the Mecca for like bionics in the world. Um, and that's kind of what my, my grand vision is. And we see a path to get there and, and, and we know like the, the right stakeholders to go in there. And it's just a matter of like, let, let's get this funded. Let's, let's make this happen. Let's make this bionic revolution happen. Um, you are, you um, certainly are a salt of earth. Um, world would have been a lot um, better place to live if we had more people like you. Um, it's been a blast talking to you. Um, thank you so much for coming and um, sharing your story. Um, it's uplifting, it's, it's inspiring, um, and hopefully people are listening. I'm going to take away the lesson that, you know, uh, thinking about other people who, have, who can do less about themselves um, is certainly the way to go. Thank you so much. Thank you, Manaj. <laughs>